amended to reinstate the measure. It being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted and courts will stand in order 101 a. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Before I call on questions, I have two matters I wish to raise. The first was I have to announce that Kevin Chapman, the doyen of parliamentary broadcasters, died in Canberra on Tuesday. He was 71. Many of us will first remember Kevin's voice, the national newsreader on ABC Radio in the 1950s and 60s, and later, of course, for his parliamentary commentary. When television came to Australia in 1956, Kevin Chapman was on camera on Channel 2, again as a national newsreader in those far-off formal days when rounded tones and meticulous punctuation were absolute minimum requirements. For those of us in Parliament, he was most affectionately remembered for his parliamentary broadcasts and for the fact that he called himself Kevin Chap Person. He, uh, for 29 years, he, uh, on a part-time and full-time basis, was in fact the voice of many of us to the people of Australia. He always spoke in a masterful way. He was well informed. He gave insightful commentary, sometimes covering division after division. He was a fine example of the art of broadcasting. For those of us who had the privilege of sitting in the broadcast booth with him, his off-air comments were no less insightful and, I might add, pithy. On behalf of all the members of the House, we extend our sympathy to his family. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I would like briefly to associate uh, myself and the members of the government with uh, that remark. I remember, along with yourself and the late Mick Young, who was then the Leader of the House, uh, uh, making some remarks uh, on his retirement in 1986. He was, as you rightly say, uh, the voice of Parliament to millions of Australians. And for those of us who listened to Parliament on uh, the radio before entering this place, uh, he was absolutely synonymous uh, with the institution. And I therefore uh, extend uh, to his family uh, my sympathy and that of the members of the Liberal and National Party. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I could uh, also have indulgence and join with you and the Prime Minister in uh, also expressing my condolences to the to the Chapman uh, family on Kevin Chapman's passing. I was, of course, uh, had only been in Parliament for six years at the time he retired, and as the, the Prime Minister said, at that point of time both he and, uh, and McYoung had, uh, had remarks to make on his uh, contribution. I, of course, remember him less in that six-year period than I remember when I, him as the, uh, as the voice constantly intervening to report on progress at points of time when I was trying to listen to my father. Uh, participate in debates in this parliament. I did from time to time uh, turn on the radio to do that. And there was a marvellous sort of um, comfort in the voice and the way in which he expressed himself. Uh, uh, this, um, this parliament, this chamber, never has been a quiet meadow, but it was the sounds of a quiet meadow that was essentially emanating from uh, Kevin Chapman and the quiet way he would introduce what would then become a complete uh, Barney across the, uh, across the chamber. But he was the voice of the parliament for many people for a very lengthy period of time. The other thing about him was uh, his, um, his dress sense, which was, uh, of course, uh, appropriate to uh, the dignified status of the house and the fact that he had a, always had a flower in his lapel, which constantly changed on a uh, day-to-day -day basis. So uh, his, uh, his, uh, his, this, this parliament is surrounded by, by great figures and great characters, not necessarily simply on the floor of the chamber, and uh, he is one of those characters, and uh, we very much regret his passing. And uh, uh, I, as I said, I join with the Prime Minister in condolences to the family. The second matter to which I wish to draw members' attention were photographs that have been brought to my attention, which appeared on the front pages of today's Age and Canberra Times, photographs of which I will table at the end of these remarks. The captions accompanying each photograph suggest a reaction by the Prime Minister of the House of Representatives yesterday to the High Court's decision in the Hindmarsh Island matter. A perusal of Hansard of that day does not reveal any reference by the Prime Minister during question time to the decision by the High Court. I propose to refer each photograph and its relevant editorial comment to the House members of the Joint Committee on the Broadcasting of Parliamentary Proceedings to consider whether the photographs and editorial comment breach existing guidelines regarding these matters, as well as requesting that those members consider the wider issue of the guidelines themselves. I table those two photostats. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Family Services. Does the Minister now acknowledge that the $1 billion this government has cut from nursing homes, home and community care and disability services has imposed an unfair and heavy burden on families who care for a child with a disability or an older relative? Isn't the Prime Minister's restoration of $270 million an, ad an admission that his savage budge budget cuts went too far? Yeah. Minister, why have you only repaired one quarter of the damage? Yeah. Well, the House has come to order. Can we have a little bit of quiet, please? The Honourable Minister for Family Services. Um. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. The Speaker. The, uh, the question from the opposition is absolutely amazing. The, the billion-dollar figure that she was referring to has no relation to reality at all. Has no relation to reality at all. What, what took place today was the first time was the first time in Australia's governmental history a government has targeted a program to assist elderly Australians stay in their home. It hasn't been done before. It hasn't been done before. And let me refer, let me refer honourable members, to sheet number five that we issued this morning. Honourable members, the assistance silent. for ageing carers. Do you know? Do you know? There's about three and a half thousand aged carers, parents that have got children that they've honourable had, Jack, elderly, Jack mature children that have got a disability. They've been looking after them for 30 years, and not one government has ever done anything about a targeted program for them. What hypocrisy to come here! What hypocrisy to come here and say and say that this is a program that ought not to be supported? It's absolute hypocrisy. You you want to look at the figures? You want to look at the figures? Where does your billion dollars come from? It's an absolute nonsense. Well, what, what, about, to the what about the money? The Ninety-five, ninety-six, two point four billion dollars was spent on recurrent aged care. The next year, listen to the increase. This is why your figures are wrong. 96, 97, 2.618 billion was spent. 97, 98, 2.76 billion will be spent. A nominal increase of 5.7 per cent. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's an absolute outrage. You are trying to perpetuate a myth that you that you had, the opportunity, you had the opportunity to address these issues and you never did. And all you can do is the first question that you asked today, the first question that you asked today ignores the fundamental good that's been done here today. It's indeed interesting to have a look at the member for Wirrawa's book. He talks about the need to develop social capital, to recognise volunteers and networking into the community, to bind a good community. We have recognised that there are 540,000 principal carers Honourable in this Member nation, Jager, Jager, and today the first time a government, a government has taken steps to support these people. You talk about social capital, we're doing it. Before I call the Honourable Member of Quarry, could I ask all members to keep their level of conversation down? The noise in the chamber is such that everybody's flat out hearing what's being said. The Honourable Member of Macquarie. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Could the Prime Minister inform the House how the government is enhancing the care of older people in the community and providing greater recognition and support for carers? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I, uh, I would like to um, take the opportunity in replying to the uh, Honourable Member for Macquarie in uh, endorsing everything that the Minister for the Family Member Services will said silent. about um, the figures being flung around erroneously by the Member for Jagger Jagger. The reality is that the package I announced uh, this Honourable morning Member for Jagger, Jagger. to the annual meeting of the Carers Association was an Australia first in terms of encouraging and supporting older Australians to remain in their own homes. Uh, all of my colleagues know, and I think all members of parliament know, that the heartfelt desire of older Australians is to stay in their own homes. That's what they want to do. And whilst governments have responsibilities in relation to residential care. They also have a responsibility, a very strong human responsibility, to provide resources to enable as many Australians as possible in their older years to remain in their own homes. And that is why we have decided to put an additional $92 million over a period of four years into community aged care packages. And the effect of this 
along with the growth of the existing programs, will be to more than double, more than double to 22,000, the number of elderly Australians who will be cared for in their own home environment, because community aged care packages are about providing services in the home to enable Australians to stay in their homes. And there is nothing more important uh, to elderly Australians than the opportunity to remain in their own home, and it is overwhelmingly the preference of Honourable older Australians that silent. they remain Honourable in their home rather than go into residential care. And I'm also very proud, Jagger, uh, Mr Jagger. Speaker, that the announcement I made this morning to the Carers Association also broke new ground in recognising the contribution to our community of those who care for people with frailties and disabilities. They are without any doubt the unsung heroes of any civilised and compassionate society. They have for a long time deserved more recognition and uh, it is uh, a real privilege to be at the head of a government that will provide an additional $92 million over a four-year period from the 1st of July 1999, which will bring about the merging of the domiciliary care benefit and the child disability allowance. As a result of this, um, there will be an additional 14,000 carers in the Australian community who will receive the benefit of the new carer allowance. This will include many thousands who are caring for elderly Australians with dementia. It Jager, will also Jager. include people who are looking after um, their relatives and friends with uh, profound intellectual impairment. It is by any measure a compassionate new policy. It is by any measure a recognition that for too long this dedicated band of Australians have been ignored. And one of the, one of the special features of this new package is that we are recognising the particular concerns of elderly Australians who have often been caring for 20, 30 or 40 years for a disabled or impaired adult child. And their greatest worry is what is going to happen to their son or daughter when they themselves are too old to look after them. And this policy, which will provide additional resources to address that particular group, I think some 8,000 uh, very old Australians with a particular need. That uh, particular measure, Mr Speaker, is, uh, I think, uh, at the heart of the compassion which underlines this policy. I thank the Minister for uh, Family Services and I thank the Minister for Social Security. I believe this is an excellent policy. It is the sort of policy which exemplifies a caring, compassionate and civilised society, and it is a policy that the Coalition is proud to present to the Australian community. The only ones you have looked after the when the Honourable Member for Hotham keeps quiet, if he wants to stay here, the Honourable Member for Dobell. The Honourable Member. The Honourable Member for Dobell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is addressed to the caring, compassionate and civilised Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister... Let's see if you'll be saying that at the end of this question. When members of the government resume their silence... Is the caring, compassionate and civilised Prime Minister aware that as a direct result of his decision to abolish the Commonwealth Dental Health Program, there has been a dramatic increase in waiting lists from people who are in desperate need? Is the Prime Minister aware of the case of a woman who has been informed that all of her teeth need to be extracted and, despite living in constant pain, it will be 18 months before she can be treated and, even then, she will have to wait for each individual tooth to cause her pain before she will be entitled to have that tooth extracted? Prime Minister, what more evidence do you need that your $400 million reduction in federal funding for dental care is causing real pain? The Honourable the Prime Minister, Mr. I ask Speaker, members to resume um, their silence. To say again to the member the for Dobell that you know as well as I do, and everybody in this House knows that if you'd have won the last election, you'd have got rid of that program. You know that, and you also know, and you also know that historically, uh, this has been a program which has been the responsibility of the states. The Honourable you, Honourable made, you made no reference in the 1996 election campaign to a continuation of the program. You didn't. You made no commitment to continue it over the four-year period, and you are being, you are being uh, quite duplicitous Don't and very no hypocritical bell. in continuing to ask these questions. 
When members resume their silence, the honourable member for Canberra, the honourable member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Family Services. Minister, how is the government ensuring older Australians have a real choice in determining whether they stay at home or choose to enter residential care? How would the government also ensure that elderly Australians receive a higher quality care than that which they have received in the past, particularly in my seat of Macon? The Honourable Minister for Family Services. I, um, I thank the uh, member for her question, and indeed, uh, as a, one, of the very few, uh, one of the very few nurses in this chamber, she understands the need for quality, quality care for older Australians, and has been, has been an advocate for the need, for, the need for us Bruce. to come up with a policies that gives a member continuum Bruce. of care. We have focused on getting right the residential aged care Bruce. arrangements in this country to address the neglect which the Labor Party, which the Labor Party left us with, and today we have taken a focus on the need to provide additional care arrangements for those people that choose to stay in their home. One fact, Mr Speaker, that people should be aware of is this, that 93 per cent of older Australians are ageing in their home, and that is their preference. That is where they would rather stay. And what we are doing here today is taking for the first time a concerted, considered approach to providing assistance to those people that would want to make that choice. And that's the key word, it's choice. We want people to have a choice. We want that to be flexibility in the range of opportunities there are to deal with those issues that I've been talking about in this place for so long. And that is the increasing number of Australians that are moving into the age category. They are the ones that are deserving of a good mix of policy, public policy, an ongoing rolling commitment of resources from the broad taxpayer, where they have the capacity to contribute to themselves themselves to the cost of their care, we are asking them to do that, and that policy is now in place, Mr Speaker. I know that the member for Macon, I know that the member for Macon has been a dedicated supporter of these policies, and indeed, as it's her birthday today, I would want to uh, yeah, yeah, why not why not recognise that fact? Because this this is a package that should be celebrated. Yeah. yeah. Now let me just make mention, Mr. Speaker. Let me make mention. Let me make mention for the benefit of the opposition. We have already the Council of the Aging in Australia has put out a press release this morning, strongly endorsing the statements by the Prime Minister this morning. And they say, altogether, we see the package as a significant advance in government's relationships with those older, frail Australians who wish to continue living in their community. We have from the Carers Association of Australia some 600 people gathered in Canberra today to hear the Prime Minister deliver this package. Total and complete acclamation for what has been achieved here today. Total and complete acclamation. And let's have a look at some of my critics. We had Nora Maguire, someone I well remember from when I appeared on a television show, kicking the tripe out of me. What did she say today? What did she say? She said, after what happened about aged care restructuring, you know, the minister, we knew it's logical that he has to do this because aged care restructuring, it's good to hear Hold something that is positive now. It's good to hear something that is positive. We are addressing these issues. We are addressing these issues because we know there has to be a sustainable age Hold policy Jagger, in this Jagger. country. There has to be a mix of policy to provide choice, real, real support for aged Australians in a meaningful way, whether they choose to go into residential care or whether they choose to stay in their home. This is a policy package that deserves the support of every thinking Australian. And I have to say, Mr Speaker, I am absolutely amazed, and I will conclude, I am absolutely amazed to see that there is an MPI. The only people in this country who are against this package is the member for Jagger Jagger. I, I want to know why. I want to know why. And I'll be very interested to hear at the end of question time why this ridiculous MPI has been put forward by the Labor Party. Why are you against, why are you against old Australians? How are you going to pay for it? Where was your policy prescriptions at your convention? Not a word. Not a word. There hasn't been a constructive contribution to this debate from the member for Jagger Jagger or the leader of the opposition from the day this debate started. When members resume their silence, I'll call the honourable member for Dobell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My Same question again is addressed to the Prime Minister. 
Did the Prime Minister receive a letter from the member for Gilmore, Joanna Gash, dated 15 November 1996, requesting that, as a matter of urgency, he review the decision to abolish federal funding for dental care? Did the letter state, quote, Prime Minister, as you would understand, people do not stomach cuts to basic health needs particularly well. Indeed, they are outraged at our insensitivity. And I have a lot of trouble defending the decision to abolish the scheme. Did the letter from the member for Gilmore go on to state, and I quote, The Honourable Member resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Parramatta on a point of order. Speaker, I don't doubt the Prime Minister is happy when to respond. When the House come to order, I'll call you. Can I have some silence, please? The Honourable Member Hotham. The Honourable Member. The Speaker, I rely on standing order 142, and in particular, House of Representatives practice at page 510, which suggests that questions referring to the attitude, behaviour, or actions of a member of parliament or the staff of members are out of order. The question relies entirely on a question of that nature, and I ask you to rule it out of order. I think the question is in order, but I think the Honourable Member for Deville needs to have in mind the constraints of the standing orders in proposing it. The Honourable Member for Deville. Speaker, did the letter to the Prime Minister also state, quote, people needing tooth extraction are being turned away each morning in agony because they can't be seen? Surely we can't stand back and watch a disaster unfold, unquote. Prime Minister, do you intend to stand back as the disaster unfolds, or will you now concede that your dental cuts are causing real pain? The Mr. Honourable Prime Mr. Minister. Speaker, I get, I get a lot of letters, and I'll check uh, whether I got such a letter. Yes, <laughs> Give me a the Honourable Member of Banks. Hmm? The, Prime, the Honourable Member of Bradfield. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I. Uh... When the members of the opposition resume their silence, the honourable members will resume their silence. The honourable member for Denison. The honourable member for Bradford. Mr. Speaker, my question, without notice, is addressed to the treasurer. Can the treasurer advise the House of the outcome of the Australian Bureau of Statistics quarterly job prospects survey? The Honourable Member of the Banks remains silent. Would the Honourable Member ask his question again? The noise level in this House makes it impossible to hear. Can the, Treasurer advise, can the Treasurer advise the House of the outcome of the Australian Bureau of Statistics quarterly job vacancies series released earlier today? What does the survey indicate about the job prospects for those seeking work in my electorate of Bradfield and that of my colleagues? The Honourable Treasurer. Well, uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Bradfield for his the question. Honourable member for Bruce, and uh, and Mr. Speaker, I think you'll be interested to know that uh, this morning the Australian Bureau of Statistics released job vacancy figures showing that uh, in February 1998 uh, trend estimates of uh, vacancies were 71,600 in the public and private sectors. Ah. For the quarter of February, job vacancies rose by 4.1%. And over the course of the year, job vacancies rose by 14.6 per cent. And I think all members of the House will welcome the fact that uh, job prospects are growing in Australia. I think everybody on both sides of the House would welcome the fact that uh, job opportunities are growing. The Honourable uh, Member I'm for sure, Prospect. Mr Speaker, uh, certainly on this side of the House, uh, there is a wide -a claim of a 14.6 per cent increase in job opportunities. And isn't that good news? For, uh, for the Australians. Honourable Member of Brisbane and the Honourable and, uh, Member of Prospect. And Mr. Speaker, I... The Honourable <laughs> Treasurer will resume his seat. The Honourable Member of Prospect is one of the Deputy Chairmen of this place. I suggest she should show an example to people in her behaviour. The Honourable Member of Brisbane and the Honourable Member of Granger and others are making a noise. I suggest you remain silent. Those of you who are conducting a ballot, I suggest you do it without making it quite so overt a demonstration of some of the problems that some of those who are casting their votes seem to happen. When the House has come to order, can I call on the Honourable the Treasurer, who is giving us a very interesting answer? The Honourable the Treasurer. Sorry, sir. The Honourable Member of the Banks will remain silent. The Honourable Member of the MacArthur, can I suggest you pick up the ballot papers later? The Honourable Member of MacArthur, would you resume your seat in the Prangabite? Prangabite. Thank you. I 
when the members of the opposition resume their silence. He can sit anywhere, as you know. The honourable the treasurer. When the honourable members have resumed their silence, the honourable member of Karangabite is quite at liberty, providing he's not intervening in debate to speak and sit anywhere in the place. The honourable the treasurer. The honourable the member of well, Brisbane. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I can I can understand the interest of the Australian Labor Party in a trip to Malaysia and Korea. <laughs> But we on this side of the House are interested about jobs in Australia. Yeah. And, uh, and the fact that job vacancies in Australia have gone up 14.6 per cent. Mr. Speaker. The honourable uh, Also being stop released today the were side. the Drake International Employment Forecast, which uh, showed that there was an improving labour market despite the downturn in Asian economies. Mr. Speaker, the Drake survey concluded that employers continue to sidestep any significant jobs fallout from the Asian currency crisis, with just 5 per cent of firms nationwide suffering reduced business opportunities as a result of the Asian financial crisis. Mr Speaker, the ABS job vacancy figures, which were released today, show that private sector job vacancies are at their highest level ever yeah. since June of 1979. Yeah. The highest level that have been taken since, uh, since we've been taking these statistics, Mr. Speaker. So, what do you see as the picture of the economy that's, uh, that's emerging, Mr. Speaker? A low inflation economy with low interest rates and increasing job opportunities. The lowest inflation rate since 1963, that's great news. The lowest interest rate since 1969, that's great news. And the best job vacancy oh, since we started recording. Side. In 1979, Mr. Speaker, these are the results of policies. You don't produce outcomes like this without policy. And uh, because it's the government's, uh, because of the government's economic uh, approach to getting the budget back into control, to reducing debt, to getting interest rates down, to getting job opportunities going, these are real policies, Mr. Speaker. And it's regrettable that uh, we find an opposition which has been absolutely incapable of coming to grips with policy prescriptions. There could be no greater indictment of the failure of the Leader of the Opposition than that one of his front benches has to write the ALP policy in a book. And, Mr Speaker, there can be no greater indictment of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition than his failure to ask a question on economics for the whole course the of the, the parliamentary sitting. Point of relevance. He's, of asked, the he's asked a specific question actually on the job figures, which is giving bogus answers. And uh, well, now the he's gone the the will not reflect on an answer in that point. Oh, right, he's gone to the point of irrelevancy. The Honourable the Treasurer, I think that every, the Honourable Member for Murray, uh, for Mallee. Before you call the Treasurer, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Speaker, Standing Order 55 for the benefit of members reads as follows When a member is speaking, no member may converse aloud or make any noise or disturbance. Mr. Honourable members of the opposition will remain silent. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable member is raising a, a valid point of order. There is, there is a constant cacophony of noise that makes it impossible for members to hear, let alone the public in the gallery. And I ask you to take some action to ask members to retain and stay quiet while contributions are being made in the parliament. The, general, the, the public is watching the behaviour of the opposition. They don't seem to realise what the bad Honourable member will resume his seat. The member raises quite a valid point of order. There is a real difficulty in hearing anything in this chamber when there is such a loud level of conversation and a loud level of noise. The Honourable the Treasurer, is, are you another point of order? Yes, Mr uh, Speaker. The Honourable Member Dennis, another yes, well, point of order. We are all being so conscientious about standing order. Standing, 50, standing order 58 says that when members enter this House, they should take their seat. Now, we've always got a ballot going on, which is distracting the Treasurer. The Honourable the Member of Dennis will resume his seat. I don't care about the Honourable the Treasurer. Well, uh, well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I was talking about job vacancies and increased employment opportunities for Australians. The, 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 the lowest inflation rate since 1963, since the Beatles sang Twist and Shout. The Honourable Member Grindler. The, the lowest interest rate since 1969, since Neil Armstrong said one small step for man. 
and the lowest unemployment rate since 1990, since Paul Keating said this was the recession we have to have. <laughs> this was the recession we had to have, Mr. Speaker. Job opportunities for Australia. But what do you find from the opposition? No questions about the economy these last two weeks. No interest in inflation or interest rates. Just the, the muckraking of the member for Hotham. We saw the deputy leader of the opposition at it this morning in one of the most disgraceful statements that you'll ever see. He came in this morning and spoke about the Prime Minister and said, this bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. That's what you said this morning. That's what you said. Disgusting statement about the Prime Minister. Can I, the treasurer, treasurer will resume his seat. The Treasurer is straying away from the question he was asked. I suggest that you return to the question you were asked, whatever the merit of the Speaker, commentary Speaker, if that is the best economic statement you can get out of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the so-called economic spokesman, disgusting racial slurs which he's throwing around this place, he ought to be condemned and the Leader should make the him withdraw. The Treasurer resume his seat. When the House resumes its silence, the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Well, my question is to the Treasurer, and it follows the answer that he has just given. Treasurer, isn't it a fact that these are the best uh, job figures only, job vacancy figures only, since February 1996, <laughs> as opposed to what you actually happen to be saying? Isn't it a fact <laughs> that since you came to power, there has been job vacancy growth of 18 per cent in the last two years, as compared to job vacancy growth of 40 per cent yeah. in the two years prior to when you came into office. Yeah. And isn't it also a fact that yeah. the other figures out today show a decline in weekly overtime rates of uh, overtime hours per employee of some 2.4 per cent in the quarter for an annual decline of 7.3 per cent, and that indicates something about where this economy may be going. So instead of boasting bogusly, Mr. Uh, Treasurer, start seat. dealing with some the real leader of the opposition resume his seat. The honourable the Treasurer. When he asks a question about the economy, <laughs> don't, don't we absolutely love it when he shows his ignorance in this house about all things economic, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, the strongest private sector vacancies, the highest level ever in the history of the series since the June quarter of 1997. Isn't that great news? Don't people, don't people welcome the highest private sector vacancy since the series began in the June quarter of 1979? Read, read the document. It's there, you poor old thing. The and, then he says, the and, then he says, and then he says, oh, yeah, but there were good vacancies coming back into 1994. Why? Why? Because we were coming off the worst recession in 60 years. He goes back and he says the Labor Party ought to be congratulated for taking, first of all, unemployment up to 11.3 per cent, and then he says, why don't you congratulate us for getting Not it down to the Brisbane. nines again? Mr Speaker, this is the lowest unemployment rate since who put Australia into recession? Since you put Australia into recession. Who was the employment minister when unemployment hit 11.3 per cent? The leader of the opposition. Who was the finance minister when Australia the went the 25 million into seat. deficit? The Honourable the Treasurer resume his seat. Mr. The, Speaker. When the Honourable Member for Grainger resumes his silence, the, his colleague, the Honourable Member for Denison, can raise his point of order. Have you a point of order? I do, Mr. Speaker. What is it? Earlier uh, today, you <laughs> earlier today you raised the point that what is your point of order that ministers should address their. Uh, comments to the House through the Chair. So they repeatedly, the they have not. repeatedly they have not, and the Treasurer the is not now. The Honourable Member for Denison resume his seat. The Treasurer should direct his answer through the, through the Mr. Chair. Mr Speaker, the I direct my answer through you. and I love getting questions on unemployment from the Leader of the Opposition, who as Employment Minister presided over unemployment rate of 11.3 per cent. Let's, let's have a guess. Who was the employment minister during Australia's worst post-war period of unemployment? He knows all about it, Mr Speaker. He produced the best unemployment rate Australia has ever had, and we don't congratulate you for it. Before I call the next question, there have been, and there are still a few left, of some 240 students from around Australia here for a National Student Leadership Forum on faith and values. Those who remain and those who have left, we extend a very warm welcome to you. The Honourable Member for Cook. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
My question is addressed to the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Minister, members of the Maritime Union of Australia have lifted their industrial action in Sydney. Could you advise the House of the nature of that dispute and how the Workplace Relations Act operated during the course of the industrial action? The Honourable Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Cook uh, for his uh, question. What's happened, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that the Wharfies Union have taken their campaign from Sydney, and now they're going to Brisbane to wreak as much havoc as they possibly can against the Patrick's Company, which, uh, gives, them, which gives them the jobs which they uh, uh, which they enjoy. And so, uh, in Brisbane. Uh, we are already starting to see the damage being done by the MUA, by the Wharfies Union. 450 tonnes of export steel are uh, being held up. 26 containers of cotton going to North Asia held up by this vandal action uh, of the MUA. And all along, Mr. Speaker, the Labor Party are basically publicly supporting them. And uh, it is interesting, Mr. Speaker, that when you look at the key elements of this dispute, uh, the fact of the matter is that. You can see the Barton. beneficial effects of the government's Workplace Relations Act uh, in operation. For example, we're told now that as they've decided to wreak havoc uh, in Brisbane, the Wharfies have decided to go back to work in Sydney. Now, part of their complaint about Sydney was that uh, they weren't going to be paid whilst they were taking industrial action, namely whilst they were running an overtime ban. Well, it's very interesting, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, a reflection on Section 187 of the 187AA of the Workplace Relations Act. The Labor Party complained about that when it was revealed about 10 days ago, but they suddenly went quiet when they realised that the New South Wales Labor Party had the same law uh, in state, uh, in state industrial relations law. But further, what's particularly interesting is that as the Wharfies are going back to work in Sydney, they've decided to lift the overtime ban. And I'll tell you why they've lifted the overtime ban, and that is because of the operation of our Workplace Relations Act. Yeah, yeah. And last, uh, what was it, last week or the week before, the latest industrial disputes figures came out. Remember, before the last election, the Labor Party said there'd be mayhem, there'd be economic chaos if we were elected, and that basically it'd be World War III. But when the actual official dispute figures came out, did we have industrial mayhem? No. We had the lowest level of industrial disputes since before World War I, and the actual number of disputes was the lowest since 1940, at the start of World War II. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what this shows is that we have policies which we have implemented and which really work, and which really are, in the area of workplace relations, getting down the level of disputes. What's Labor's policy? Well, Labor's policy is basically dictated to them by the ACTU part of which is to repeal the Trade Practices Act, which is the one law which keeps a leash uh, on the uh, industrial thuggery in the trade union movement, supported by the Labor Party. And on the balance of their policies, what are their policies? Well, actually, they don't have any policies other than that which is directed to them uh, by the ACTU. And so, uh, as you watch the doorstops in the morning, Mr Speaker, and as the questions go to the Labor Party, what are your policies? What do we get? All we get is the muckraking that we've had from the Labor Party, which reached an all-time low, Mr. Speaker, with the sleazy, slimy, racist slur uh, from uh, the deputy leader of the opposition. Yeah, yeah. This just shows you, just just shows you the low depths to which you people will go. And the leader of the opposition on the yeah. industrial the dispute on the Australian will return world. to the answer to the question, the honourable well, minister. Speaker, uh, this is a demonstration, Mr. Speaker. When you look at the waterfront dispute, that when there is a national interest to condemn the industrial action of these industrial thugs, the leader of the opposition fails to publicly condemn their actions and can't even bring his own front bencher to meet reasonable standards of reasonable behaviour. The honourable member for Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My the question House is... will come to order. The Honourable Member Oxley. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Is the Minister aware of reports that people are flying to Australia and, upon arrival, destroying their passports and then attempting to claim refugee status? Can the Minister explain what steps are taken to identify people who attempt such illegal entry to our country? In such cases, is fingerprinting used to identify those who may be international criminals? 
The Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Well, I, I do thank the Honourable Member for her question because it does give me the opportunity to uh, say a little about the way in which the asylum system, of which we are very proud here in Australia, is by larger numbers of people than I think desirable being the subject of very considerable abuse. Um, this last year we've received something of the order of 11,000 asylum claims in Australia. Uh, those numbers are very much larger than uh, we have experienced in recent years. I think back in the early 80s it was something of the order of 500 such claims that were received. Um, many of them come from countries where one doesn't ordinarily expect asylum claims to arise. And um, the difficulty is that uh, you have to assess each case, um, case by case. You have to make provision for people to be able to have their circumstances reviewed. There seems to be a desire on the part of some to perpetuate an arrangement where access to the courts uh, is also provided. And we have something of the order, I think, of 900 uh, cases where people are expecting to be able to get judicial review on top of all of the other access that is provided. Um, and this is system is in place to ensure that we don't refoul to any country a person who has a well-founded fear of persecution. But when we uh, get manifestly unfounded claims, they damage irreparably the opportunities of us to be able to deal with quickly the circumstances of people who may have been tortured and traumatised or in need of assistance. Um, and when people who are seeking to do that um, want to often disguise their identity, dispose of documentation that might help us in a proper investigation of their claims, sometimes to be able to put a story that would be inconsistent with whatever documentation they may be carrying, it does make our task very much more difficult. Uh, but I want to assure the member that uh, the approach that we take is one that uh, deals with these matters with integrity. Um, we do seek to ensure that the system, one, is not abused, but that any genuine refugee does receive protection in Australia, um, and we use every avenue available to be able to ensure that people who have been uh, known to uh, authorities in other countries, um, that, they, uh, that those matters are properly checked. The character issues are addressed in the process, um, and, uh, and we use the appropriate means for ensuring that they are properly addressed. Before I call the next member, I'd like to extend a welcome to the Honourable Minister for Education from Samoa, whom I see sitting in a gallery. Welcome. The Honourable uh, Member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Can the Minister inform the House of the Government's progress towards providing more flexible English language tuition to migrants through the competitive open tendering of adult migrant English programs? The Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. The Honourable Member for Denison will remain silent. I thank the Honourable Member for his. I thank the Honourable Member for Dunkley for his question on this matter because it does enable me to uh, tell him what's happening in relation to the area of adult migrant education and also to. Uh, also to brief other members who have spoken on these matters in both uh, grievance debates and in the 30-second statements. Uh, and I might also add, uh, for the benefit of the Honourable Member for Werriwa, who has expressed some interest in these matters and notes uh, very much the importance of English language competency in ensuring that people are able to settle here effectively in Australia. Um, he looks puzzled. Uh, I, I found a reference on page 250. Um, but uh, let me just. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll tell the honourable member. I'll tell, I'll tell the honourable member himself if he's interested in that matter. The but let me address his response through the Mr. Chair. Speaker, let me just say that I want to take the opportunity of addressing this question in a factual way because uh, it's important that we deal with. It's important that we deal with uh, with facts rather than myths that are often being created. So the first point that ought to be made is that there have been no reductions at all in the uh, way in which uh, the teaching of English language to new arrivals is resourced. Um, provision is made by law for us to fund appropriate tuition of 510 hours to all new arrivals in Australia. Uh, and on top of that, 
um, because that's a, that's a requirement by law. On top of that, we provided this year an additional $17 million over four years uh, to provide assistance for those who are refugees and humanitarian entrants to address um, their English language needs. But uh, we also need to ensure that the provision of money um, is uh, undertaken to ensure that we can provide the most flexible service, both in time and location, and type of tuition that is received to those new arrivals. And uh, we are endeavouring to ensure that the best service is provided, uh, along with value for money, and we have put the system out for tender. And uh, in relation to that, what we have found is that those in those states, in those states where the bodies that deal with these matters evidence um, a deal of uh, desire to adjust their manner of uh, conducting the contractual arrangements, enter into partnerships with other organisations to put in place more flexible arrangements. In other words, are imaginative in the way in which they deal with these matters. They have been able to win the tenders, and in most states that has happened. In the one area, in the one area in which I think, um, perhaps because of the activities of the New South Wales Teachers' Federation, where the organisation itself has proven to be more inflexible. Um, they weren't able to win three of the tenders that were offered in five regions in New South Wales. Now, the Honourable Member Prospect, in some comments that she made, commented in relation to the tenderer, commented in relation to the tenderer, um, the Australian Centre for Languages, the Australian Centre for Languages, um, that, uh, that they had no experience in providing English as a second language course for poorly educated migrants or humanitarian refugees. Now, I have to tell the honourable member that is untrue. The organisation itself has had considerable experience in relation to those matters. It held a number of contracts for teaching to those very groups of people um, through the programs that were funded previously by DICHA, but also programs that have been funded in New South Wales. They also brought into their consortium partners with very considerable experience as well. Mission Australia, the University of Wollongong, the Macquarie University College, the St George and Sutherland Community College. In other words, uh, they have as partners people who have a wide range and wealth of experience in English language teaching, and those services are related very much to teaching amongst the uh, those migrants who have a poor level of literacy in their own language, and particularly those who have come through the refugee stream. And I want to make it very clear that the government is committed, is committed to maintaining uh, high-quality education for English language migrants here in Australia. Um, and it is important, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is important to talk about these matters in a factual way. We don't need myths. Another area in which there are myths has been Labor's protestation that it does not want a race election. And one of the comments that worried me greatly this morning were the comments of the Honourable Member for Honourable Banks, the Honourable Member Banks, who had the audacity to say that there is only Honourable one thing missing from Honourable this debate, Honourable and that is the white sheets Minister, and burning crosses. It does the Honourable Member no service, the and it brings the whole question of debate into disrepute. That the Honourable Member Prospect remains silent. Members of the government will remain quiet. The honourable member for Dobell. I'd suggest that petulant behaviour on all sides is not really a great tribute to this place. The honourable member for Dobell. Set a standard. You found Joanna's letter yet? Have you found the Joanna's letter yet? The honourable member for Dobell resume his seat if he hasn't a question. I'll call the next question. question. My question without call notice question. is addressed the to the member Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Cowan, you'll resume your seat. <coughs> Thank you, you did not ask Mr. your Speaker. question. You Could do the not... Treasurer inform the, the House what progress has been made by the, the Honourable Member for Cowan, resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Cowan, resume his seat. There is not a practice in this place, if you are called on to ask a question, to carry on with an interchange across the House. You did so. You did not. Way by waving a letter across the chair, asking the members of the government ask a, a question in the normal way. There are proper ways by which you direct a question. Well, let me just respond to you first. You know the direct way by which you ask a question. You want to, I call the member on a point of order. My point of order is, Mr. Speaker, order. you called the member for Cowhand before he stood when I was on my feet seeking your call. 
You had been seated because you had not. How could you call the member for Cowen before the he stood up? The honourable member resume his seat. How could the honourable member resume his seat. The honourable leader of the opposition. Is this? How about a bit of procedural fairness in this place, Mr. Speaker? We put up in this chamber with repeated abuse of relevance as far as question time is concerned. You sit there smiling, and you know exactly what's going on with that repeated the abuse of question of time. The there is one element, one element of retaliation of here, and you rule that person silent. out of order. Where is the procedural fairness in that? Members of the government remain silent, and so will the members of the opposition. There is a procedure and a the honourable member will resume his seat. There is a procedure and a proper procedure for asking questions. In the present instance, the honourable member for Dobell was not addressing his question as he should. If the honourable the honourable member Hotham will resume his seat, if the honourable member Do the honourable member for Hotham will behave properly and don't shake your head like that. If you want to, <laughs> right, I, the, I name the honourable member for Hotham. That he be suspended from the service of the House. The question is: the honourable member of the be removed, be suspended from the service of the House. Those on that table to say aye. Those against no. Only the ayes have it. Those have it. The ayes have it. Ring the bells. Ring the bells. I'll deal with the honourable member for Batman after the division. I would suggest that honourable members remember that there is no sanctity within a division and consequently any matters that you might avert to outside a division are not subject to parliamentary privilege. Your behaviour does not enhance your own status in the society. I thought even the honourable the manager of opposition business would realise if he wishes to take a point of order and address the chair during a division, the custom in this place would be to put something on your head. Point of order. When the House resumed at order, the honourable member Hotham has a point of order. Mr. Speaker, you rule the member for Dobell. You asked him to resume his seat. That is a point of order relating to the proceedings. It's not a matter relating to the division. I'll take a point of order relating to the conduct of the division. You have now that point of order does not relate to the proceedings now before the House. That is unfortunately now past that stage. We're now at the stage of the division. You can only take a point of order related to the division itself. Yes, you may take a point of order. Thank you, division. Mr. Speaker. We are having this division because you warned me oh, and oh, named me when I was attempting to get up and take Shoot. a point of order. And the point of order I was taking was that the member for Dobell had prefaced his question properly because the words he used to the Prime Minister were, have you got the letter yet? It clearly flowed from an earlier question that he'd asked. It was in the knowledge of the Prime Minister and it was completely in order. And that's why we have reacted to your ruling. The now, naming, if you're going to give these sorts of inconsistency, you will lose control of this the house. Honourable and member you will, will not, not threaten the chair. The honourable, when the house resumed some silence, the honourable member was named because he constantly ignored the chair and abused the privilege and responsibilities it has. The honourable member knows it wasn't for shaking his head. No, I don't. No, I don't. 
It was far more than that. It was for disorderly conduct, which is the basis of the standing order. I suggest you look at Standing Order 303. Have a look at the tapes. Have a look at the tapes. I suggest you look at the question that the member for Dobell asked. You have ruled out the honourable member knows the way in which questions are to be addressed, and they should be addressed properly. Lock the doors. I, the question is that the honourable member be suspended from the service of this house. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. The honourable members, I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fisher and Riverina Tellers for the ayes, and the honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong Tellers for the noes. instructions from you, Prime Minister. Yeah. The only code you'll enforce is taking us all. Just because he's missed out on the ticket to old England and new England, it's no point, no need to take it out on us. <laughs> Nowhere to go. Lost the tickets both ways. The result of the division is eyes 86, snows 41. The honourable member is suspended from the service of this house. Before I call anybody, I ask the honourable member for Batman to withdraw that reflection on the chair he made during the division. Mr. Speaker, which reflection was that? The honourable member will withdraw the reflection about which he knows on the chair. Mr. Speaker, is that the question? Will the that honourable member withdraw the reflection? I'm asking which, re will the honourable which member reflection. Withdraw the reflection? I'll withdraw the I reflection the that you made on Batman. numerous occasions about the, the member be suspended from the service of the house. The question is that the honourable member be suspended from the service of the house. Those in that favour, please say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. 
Division required, ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that the honourable member for Batman be suspended from the service of his house. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I point the honourable members for Karangamite, Fisher and Riverina tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong tell us for the nose.
The Honourable Member for La Trobe. His place during the, the division. The Honourable Member for Canberra will resume his seat. We are conducting a division. I don't want to see
Total of the division is eyes 87, nose 44. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Honourable Member for Batman is suspended from the service of the House 24 hours. The Honourable Member for Cowan will resume his seat. I call the Honourable Member for Dobell, in light of the circumstances, to address his question. I believe that my it needs to be addressed to the Prime Minister. Is, my question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that his office called the Member for Gilmore? seeking help for a person who needed urgent dental care and, in the member's words, quote, his plight was so bad that the PM's office needed something done urgently, unquote, and that the member for Gilmore prevailed on a local dentist to help out. Prime Minister, are you also aware that she went on to say in a letter to the Health Minister, quote, that is a one-off, which I cannot continue to do. This man's crisis was not isolated, and those who continue to suffer will not be so lucky because they will not know who to turn to. Prime Minister, will you now admit that you have dramatically increased waiting times for dental surgery, or is the only way left for people in need of urgent dental care to call you on 026 277 7700? The Honourable Prime Minister. And Mr Speaker, I am not uh, personally aware of the circumstances to which the Honourable Member has referred. I will naturally investigate them. Can I say in can I say in relation to the issue generally that it remains the case that uh, if you had been re-elected you, you would not have continued this program. Honourable you made no commitment silent. to a four-year continuation of the program during your campaign. The Honourable Members will remain silent. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cowan. Oh, sorry, the Honourable Member for Lindsay. Oh, sorry. The Honourable Member resumes the seat. The Honourable Member Abel has a point of order. I seek leave to table the two letters I've referred to. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. The Honourable Member Valenti. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Has the Department established a unit called Images of Australia to ensure the tolerant, culturally diverse and decent values of most Australians are transmitted to the international community? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for Lindsay for her question. I know she and many other members of the House would appreciate the efforts that are made by my department internationally to put uh, the best, Australia's best step forward and ensure that our country is understood for what it really is, which is a culturally diverse, very tolerant and very decent country. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Images of Australia unit, I have to say, has been a very great success in promoting those images of Australia. And uh, I think um, you know, they are values in this country which we have great pride in. It's a, a great thing for us to be able to go around the world and say in Australia, people, people from 130 different countries of the world have come together and live on, on the whole very harmoniously together. It's a great thing to be able to say that we're one of the world's oldest continuously operating democracies but that our democracy works on the basis of un some unwritten rules, unwritten rules of public debate and unwritten rules of decency. And, Mr Speaker, most Australians uphold those Honourable unwritten Member rules Denison. of public debate. Honourable but, Mr Member Speaker, Denison. there are the occasional exceptions. There are the exceptions who undermine the image and reputation of this country. And we said, saw a very the good Honourable example Member of Denison. it this morning. We saw an example of it this morning when somebody in the senior position of Deputy Leader of the Opposition, one of the significant people in the political spectrum of this country, has made a statement saying of the Prime Minister, this bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. Now, Mr Speaker, for the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the alternative Deputy Prime Minister of this country, to be reducing public debate in this country to that level 
it's not only shameful, but it does indeed damage the image of decency and tolerance in this country. And coming from a man who was once the foreign minister, I say I regard that as particularly surprising. But, Mr. Speaker, it would serve the House well if the Deputy Leader of the Opposition did the honourable and decent thing and apologise to the Prime Minister and apologise to this House for what he has done. Because if he did that, he would uphold at last the standards of decency and tolerance which this country promotes internationally so strongly. But to leave a statement like that on the record without the apology is damaging to this country the and, of course, Foreign very Minister damaging to his seat. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. There's nothing in that question which provokes or legitimises a piece, an outburst like this from the Foreign Minister, Mr Speaker. The Foreign Minister was asked a question regarding the general status of Australia, and I believe the answer to agree was relevant. But I suggest the Foreign Minister is now moving as far from the question. I suggest he return to, specific, to specifically answering the question. Mr Speaker, at the Belize. end of the day, behaviour in this parliament is relevant to the images of Australia. It is relevant to the way the world sees Australia. This parliament is shown on Australian television into many countries of South East and even North, East, uh, North Asia. And some of the things that are said in this parliament and some the of the Honourable things that are said in public seat. debate. The Honourable Member for, for Newcastle on a point of order. Yeah, well, for, the, for the Minister to, to address the issue, the, to address, what's your point of not, order? That he, what, he, what he is doing exceeds the forms of the House for taking exception to behaviour of a Member of The Honourable Member will resume his seat. The question was regarding standards in behaviour. I have asked the Foreign Minister to return to answering the question. The Honourable Foreign Minister. And Mr Honourable Speaker, Dempsey. indeed I will, because this is about the image of the country. It's about what's transmitted to our region through news services, through Australian television. It's about what's read and understood about this country. And one of the things that's understood about this Honourable country today is that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition accuses our Prime Minister of somebody who's happy when he's bashing blackfellas. Yeah. He should. He should withdraw that statement. He should apologise. And, Mr. Speaker, if he doesn't apologise, the leader of the opposition should make him do so. Because, to the integrity of the Labor Party, the, the integrity of the Parliament, and the, the integrity of public debate. The, the honourable member for Denison on the th This I'm House sorry, and the I public will receive. believe. The process is to be partisan. If a minister can repeatedly defy your ruling the and continue honourable this member personal Dennis attack, his seat. He's the honourable member for Chifley on a point of order. Well, Mr. I'm Mr. sorry, I did not see you, Mr. Speaker. You, twice you've asked the minister to return to the point of the question, and he is neglecting to heed your advice and guidance. The I'd, ask member, you, I'd ask you to rule that he returned to the point of the question. The Honourable uh, Member for Chifley, I thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, in answer to a previous question, persists in this myth that uh, the Labor Party intended to shut down the dental care program. My question is this. Were that the case, Prime Minister, why in these budget papers of your first budget statement, 1996-97, there appears this item, cessation of the Commonwealth Dental Programme, savings, uh, savings in the budget, minus 55.6 million, savings 97-98, minus 112 million, savings 98-99, minus 114.5 million, 99-2000, minus 116.5 million. Were you misleading the House or was your Treasurer on that occasion? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Not misleading the House. The situation remains that you had no indication during the campaign of your intention to continue the programme. The Honourable, when the House has come to order, the Honourable Member for Adelaide. No. Much, Hi, Mr. Hi, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is addressed to the Prime Minister. What, Prime Minister, what is the government's response to the High Court's decision on the High Marsh Island issue? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, can I say uh, in reply to the uh, to the Honourable Member? The Honourable Deputy that, um, Leader. 
as, uh, as expressed by the, by the Special Minister for State yesterday, the government welcomes the decision of the High Court of Australia in the Hindmarsh Bridge case. It uh, brings, I hope, to an end uh, a very sorry chapter in which there was an enormous amount of money expended. I think there was ill will generated in the community uh, between uh, Australians of different backgrounds. But I want, in the course of commenting upon the government's reaction to the decision of the High Court, Mr. Speaker, I want to draw attention to some remarks that were made in the press this morning, and in particular some remarks that were made at the doorstop this morning by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I, want to, I will put them in context. I will certainly put them in context. And the first context that I should put it in, Mr Speaker, is, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition well knows, I made no reference at all, no reference at all, in the parliament yesterday to the Hindmarsh Bridge case. Absolutely no reference. And, 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 and the jig to which the, 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 jig, the jig to which the Deputy Leader of the Opposition refers in the age. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, the jig. The jig to which the honourable member, the honourable uh, deputy leader of the o opposition, refers as a the perusal of both the video of question time yesterday and also the transcript of Hansard will record that the jig to which he refers, which is this, was a reference I made to the treasurer when he interjected, "Why did you give tax deductibility to the Evatt Foundation?" That's what it was about. And that's what it was about. It had absolutely yeah, nothing whatever to do. Nothing whatever to do with the Hindmarsh Bridge. And, and what is appalling? What is appalling about the behaviour? The Mr. Speaker, Mr. Brisbane what silent. What is appalling about the behaviour of the deputy leader of the opposition is that, unlike the, unlike, the honourable prime minister, oh, resume his seat. A point the of order leader on the, of the opposition on a point of order. Yes, it goes to a point of order by uh, members of the government. Will remain that deals silent. with the point of the validity of this question and whether it's within the framework of standing orders. And I draw your attention to page 509 on questions. The underlying principle is that ministers uh, are required to answer questions only on matters for which they are responsible to the parliament. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers, which include, for example. Here we are. Statements by people outside the House, including other members, notably opposition members. I would have thought under that, Mr Speaker, the given it wasn't a statement made inside here, given that it's absolutely not within any portfolio responsibility the of his, the question is out of order. The Leader of the Opposition knows that as far as on the same point of order? The Honourable Member O'Connor on the point of order. Mr Speaker, I, on, on that point of order, I draw your attention to two factors. One. The Leader of the Opposition is referring to constraints placed by the standing orders on questions. The time for him to take such a point of order is at the end of the question, the not Honourable halfway Member, through the answer, which is not so constrained. Honourable Member, resume his seat. There is no doubt that the question from the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh related specifically to a matter pertaining to a decision of the High Court yesterday. And while I take note of what the Leader of the Opposition has said, the answer being given by the Prime Minister relates directly to reporting in today's media on that question. And I therefore call the Honourable the Prime Minister to continue his answer. Mr Speaker, as I was saying, the, the, truth, the truth of the matter is that I made no reference yesterday to the Hindmarsh Bridge decision. The photograph to which the honourable member refers, the jigging one as he calls it, uh, that one was, was in fact in the course of an answer I was giving, an answer I was giving to a question asked of me by the member for Hotham. And any kind of decent any kind of decent person would have perused that and, and, and look, but you have the deputy leader honourable of the opposition has no excuse. The deputy leader of the opposition, unlike the uh, the leader writer of the Melbourne Age was present when the incident took place. The deputy leader of the opposition knew that I didn't mention Hindmarsh. The deputy leader of the opposition knew that he knew that he was being deceitful at the doorstop. But, Mr. Speaker, that is only that is only Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that is only that is only the half of it. What we have seen here is 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 very much of a kind with the remarks that were made by the member for Banks. The marks to which the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, Affairs drew attention. Some remarks that were made some months ago that likened the attitude of members of my party on the native title issue to the behaviour and the attitudes of the Ku Klux Klan. 
And that was something that the Leader of the Opposition had neither the power nor the intestinal fortitude to do anything about. The Leader of the Opposition failed to discipline the member for Banks, and once again the Leader of the Opposition has failed to discipline the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, because what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said at the doorstop this morning— this is irrelevant to the question on Hindmarsh, Mr. President. How could it be relevant to it if he's referring now, though he, though he got Raddock to talk about this as though it was something the that happened today? The honourable member, leader of the opposition, will resume his the seat. The minister for immigration. The honourable leader of the opposition knows that this matter has been canvassed extensively in today's media. The question was raised by the honourable member for Hindmarsh, pertaining to a decision by the High Court. The Prime Minister is identifying comment in today's media regarding what was said to be reactions against what he said on that subject. The Honourable the Prime Mr. Minister. Speaker, let me, let me for the benefit of the House say again, this is what, and I want the House to listen very carefully to this, and particularly uh, uh, members of the public in the gallery, I want to repeat what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said. This bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. Now let me say that again. This bloke never seems to be so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. Mr Speaker, you should apologise. The Honourable Prime Minister resume his seat. When the members of the government resume their silence, the Honourable Members of the Government will remain their silent. The Honourable Member for Bacon remains silent. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Conceivable relevance. It has to relate what I said. It has to relate what I said to the circumstance that occurred in this place yesterday. And that relationship is evident when you read the whole sentence of which that was the tailpiece. Read the whole sentence. The if Honourable you're going to be Deputy fair, will I'll give it to you if you want it. Read the whole. The Honourable Deputy Leader will resume his seat. The House will come to order before I call the Prime Minister. The Honourable Prime Minister. If you Minister. are to have any relevance to decency in politics, you should apologise. Yeah. You, should have, you should have the courage to apologise, because what you and your leader are doing, you are both deliberately the inflaming the, the temperature of this debate. Silence. Prime Minister, resume his seat. I haven't called you yet. Just remain. When the House, is, the Honourable Member of Correa will remain silent. The Honourable Member for Denison a on a point on, of order. I take a point on relevance. We are having a personal attack from a man who doesn't even have the decency the to apologise on the seat. stolen generation. The Honourable Member Denison will resume his seat. The Honourable the Prime Minister needs to respond to the question put, and I believe he's now doing so. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, uh, I have to say that I find myself. Um, uh, in, uh, in agreement with Father Brennan when he said a few weeks ago that there are people in the Labor Party who are hell-bent on having an election on this particular issue. You are the people who want an election on WIC, and by the Leader of the Opposition's failure to restrain the Deputy Leader, he's giving evidence of that. The Honourable Prime Minister will resume his seat. A point of order on the relevance. Leader of the Opposition. This is a question about Hindmarsh Bridge. It was a specific question directed to him. He has canvassed everything except that particular judgment here in this place, and it is massively irrelevant and massively disorderly. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. As the Leader of the Opposition would know, having been a minister in this place for many years, that a ministerial response can relate to the breadth of a question put, and the Prime Minister is entirely in order in responding to the question of the Honourable Member behind Mars. The Honourable Prime it, Minister. Mr Speaker, not only was the, uh, were the motives imputed the to me Blackson. by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition in relation to my alleged response to the Hindmarsh Bridge decision, not only were those uh, motives absolutely baseless, not only were those allegations wrong in fact, not only were those allegations completely without foundation, but the manner in which they were made, the particular language used, the was Denison. deliberately calculated to inflame the temperature of this whole debate. And you, you in the Labor Party, you run around in your self-righteous fashion. You say those terrible people over there on the, the government side, for you want to have a race election. Yet you dare to use words like, this bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. I not only find that offensive to Indigenous people, I find it personally very offensive. I find it highly offensive to the motives 
of, of, of millions of people in Australia who happen to agree that we have taken a principled stand, not only on the Hindmarsh Bridge issue, but we've also taken a principled stand on the native title issue. But, Mr Speaker, when the judgment is made on this issue by the Australian people, the person who will have failed the test of leadership will be the Leader of the Opposition. It is the Leader of the Opposition who has failed to discipline the member for banks. It is the Leader of the Opposition who has failed to discipline the, member, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. It is the Leader of the Opposition that has allowed others in his party to run the agenda on the native title issue. And it is the Leader of the Opposition who is now allowing members of his own party to run amok to make inflammatory comments, to turn up the temperature of this debate. On the Prime Minister to resume his seat when the yes, members of the government resume their side. This is a very specific question on I mean, this is, Apart from being about a ten-minute answer in which he goes round and round his polling, the which he goes round and round his polling, he is absolutely way off anything that conceivably relates to the high The Honourable Leader of the Opposition knows that the answer of a minister can range fairly widely in the and the Prime Minister is in order. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Speaker, bogus points of order won't relieve the Leader of the Opposition from his responsibility to lead on this issue. Bogus points of order won't absolve the responsibility that he carries, along with the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the Member for Banks, for tainting the character of this debate. It is a difficult issue. It is a sensitive issue. And when the final chapter is written on this debate, three remarks will stand like stone and they will condemn the people out of whose mouths they were uttered. The first of those was the reference to racist scum by Noel Pearson. The second remark was the reference to the Ku Klux Klan by the member for Banks. And the third remark was that made this morning by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. If he had any sense of decency and courage, he Banks. would apologise and withdraw. But obviously he's not going to do so, Mr Speaker. So I ask that further questions be placed on the notice yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah. Are there any? I call the honourable member for Banks, who I understand has both a personal explanation and a question to go. Mr. Mr. Speaker, has the honourable I member seek leave been to make misrepresented? Just before I call the honourable member for Banks, has the honourable member been misrepresented? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I claim to be misrepresented most grievously by the minister. For multicultural and affairs, the honourable member for Banks. and also from the Prime Minister, the honourable Mr. Member Speaker, Banks. earlier in question time today, the minister qu uh, quoted the following: "One of the comments that worried me greatly this morning were the comments of the honourable member for Banks, the honourable member for Banks, who had the audacity to say that there's only one thing missing from this debate, and that's the white sheets and burning crosses." It does the honourable member no service, and it brings the whole question of debate into disrepute. And, Mr. Speaker, just a moment ago, the Prime Minister said that those remarks were made in the structure of the native title debate, and some months ago, Mr. Speaker, uh, any person listening to that answer would have believed that I said the statements this morning. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the minister was selectively quoting from a document given to him by the Mr Tony Nutt, the, the Prime out. Minister's Member Chief of, of Staff. Mr Speaker, in fact, the document is a media monitor's document that the minister handed to me, and it is dated the 29th of May 1997 in the following terms. Channel 2 subject, 7.30 report, Stolen Generations. Interview Darrell Mellum, Opposition Aboriginal Affairs Spokesman. Sarah Henderson, Reporter. Today, no one in the government was talking off the record, but the opposition was. Darrell Mellum, and this is the full quote. In terms no, of stolen right generations. Right. The Honourable Member, resume his seat. The Honourable Member wrote Connor on a point of order. Requirements for any member on a personal explanation uh, to quickly state where they were misrepresented and deny it if that is the case. They the are not to go the through lengthy member debate on the seat. issue. The Honourable Member for Banks, the Honourable Member for Prospect will remain silent. The Honourable Member for Banks is dealing in a very sensitive area and I think all members should allow him some latitude in explaining the circumstances of his alleged misrepresentation. I would suggest, however, that the honourable member for Banks 
has in mind the constraints on personal explanations and, and restrains his remarks entirely to them. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I again say that the comments on the document are Mr Ruddock, for your use, Tony Nutt. Darrell Mellon, in terms and, and dated 29th of May 97, media monitors yet confidential. The honourable written members will remain silent. Darrell Mellon, in terms of stolen generations, this is the, the exact member. quote. Darrell Mellon, in terms of stolen generations, what we have to do is have a considered response, and it's about time the prime minister showed leadership. There's only one thing missing from this debate. And that's the white sheets and the burning crosses. And that's been the undercurrent in this debate. Honourable members will remain silent. Honourable members of the government will remain silent. Mr Speaker, those comments were made in relation to the stolen children. There was no reference the in relation to the Ku Klux Klan. They were made on the 29th of May 1997. There was no statement made by me this morning. There was no statement Honourable made by me in recent months, and I ask that the minister and the prime minister apologise to the house. The honourable member has finished his personal explanation. I understand you had a question. Oh. Members of the government will remain silent. They're not helping in maintaining some decorum in this place. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I claim to be misrepresented and I seek leave to make the a personal Honourable explanation. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, among the various bits of free character analysis I received today at question time were a number of statements to the effect that in what I said about the Prime Minister this morning, I had been guilty of a racist slur. May I make the point, may I make the point at the outset, Mr. Speaker, that it's not racist to suggest that someone has behaved offensively on a racist matter. As to the substance of what I actually the said— The Deputy Leader resume his seat. The Honourable Member for O'Connor on a point of order. I again—would you sit down, please? The hon sit yes, the Honourable down. Deputy Leader resume his seat. Sit down, the Honourable Member for O'Connor on a point of order. Mr Speaker, Standing Order 64 says, Having obtained leave from the chair, a member may explain matters of a per personal nature, although there be no question before the House. But such matters must not be debated. The, Every word that the, the Deputy Member Leader of the Opposition was, is debating the issue. The Honourable Member O'Connor will resume his place. What the Deputy Leader the Honourable Leader of the Opposition remains silent. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition is explaining the context of the matters where he alleges he was being misrepresented. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition may needs I continue to have in mind the restrictions of the standing orders. May I continue the Honourable by saying Deputy Leader that the words I used immediately preceding those that have been quoted are these. What I said was this. I do find it somewhat tacky, however, that the Prime Minister reacted with the exuberance that he so obviously did when he was given the news of the 5-1 decision against the Aboriginal women. And then I went on to make the expression that you have quoted in that Honourable particular Minister context. I was suggesting— I was suggesting— silent. Honourable I was simply suggesting that the Prime Minister was behaving offensively on a racially sensitive the matter. The Honourable Member has it. now finished his personal no, explanation. I also wish you... There is one further well, point, Mr Speaker. To a personal explanation, I have been not asked to apologise. Can I respond yes, to that Honourable request Deputy for an apology? Leader. It is obviously a matter of contest between us as to what precise form the Prime Minister's exuberance took yesterday. I accept the Prime Minister's explanation. The Honourable Member resume his seat. I accept the Prime Minister's explanation. I'll just say that I accept his explanation because he's made it in this Are House, and I would not presume that he would mislead the House. That that this particular photograph was not. Honourable. The Honourable Deputy Leader has the call, oh, but I suggest he finishes his personal explanation. I'm responding to a request for well, an apology. What I'm saying is, mark. if the Prime Minister says that photograph was not the occasion that he was expressing his delight at the news, I accept that. However, he was given a bit of paper in the his Honourable place yesterday. As I understand, seat. you are laughing the your head off at that stage when you're given seat. that bit of paper. The Deputy Leader will resume his seat. Honourable members will remain, resume their silence. The Honourable Member for Newcastle, do you wish to make a personal explanation? A question to you, Mr Speaker. A question to you. The Honourable I, Member for I Newcastle. I raised a point of, uh, point of order earlier. If I draw your attention to Standing Order 76, 
And it would seem to me that a request for an apology by, by a member of this place imputes another member. Question, Standing Order 76, rule such imputations out of order. And I would ask if you would consider that. And As the Honourable Member would later. know, you are allowed to direct questions on matters of administration, and frankly, I don't see how that's a matter of administration. In terms of the phrases used and expressions made inside and outside this place, the Honourable Member, better than most, will know that many people say things which they don't necessarily mean, and the procedures are intended to allow for some flexibility in uh, considering them. The Honourable Member for Banks wish to ask a question of me. Thanks, first. Mr. Speaker, my question to you relates to your rulings that ministers are not required to table doc confidential documents from which they, uh, they are quoting when we request so under the standing orders. Earlier today, the, uh, the Minister <coughs> for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs gave me a copy of a media monitor's report that had been given to him. And on the back it says, Mr. Ruddock, for your use, Tony Nutt. It's a media monitor's extract, and on the top it says confidential. The media monitor's is a public document. Mr Speaker, it was a partial quote from the transcript. My question to you is, in terms of, does he have to table the whole document when asked? He selectively quotes, if anything has it, if, if confidential is put on a media monitor's document, does that preclude the tabling of that whole document by the minister, or does the minister have to table the whole the of the public document? Because what we've got the here Honourable Honourable is cut and paste. Seat. As the honourable member for Banks would know, the speaker has no control over determining what documents are claimed to be confidential and those which are not. What I have a responsibility to do is to ask a minister whether or not the document is confidential, and that I do. In this instance, the Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs was not asked to table the document, and therefore I don't see the relevance of the question. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would allow the member for Holt and the member for Banks to apologise to the Prime Minister for attempting to slur him with racism. Mr Speaker, Mr. Honourable... Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we all know that in this debate, uh, when one is debating uh, issues of land rights and native title, we all know that passions can be inflamed. The Honourable Mr. Member Mr. Speaker, Calgary, and it, it has always been the intention the of this will government. His seat. I'm afraid I've got a point of order. The Honourable Mr. Member of Kalgoorlie. Mr. Mr. President, uh, Speaker, I, I was actually well on my feet before the member, uh, the treasurer, was called. I actually had a question to you. And it's, it, go, it goes to this. Well, I'm sorry, we're now into the motion. I will ask you to direct your question after we've finished the motion before the House. I'm sorry I did not see you. Members rise in this place, and frankly, it's very difficult at times to work out whether they, the purpose of their rising. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. The Mr. Call. Speaker, because we all know that passions can be inflamed in a debate like this. We all know, Mr. Speaker, that it is very easy for people to come along and inflame passions for their own political advantage in relation to this. And Mr Speaker, at all times on this issue, the Prime Minister has shown absolute leadership, absolute leadership in securing justice between the rights of uh, native title claimants and securing justice between those who have pastoral lease. And Mr Speaker, I want to say for my own part and for the part of this government and for the part of this party, the, the joint the parties that he leads, the, the Prime Honourable Minister has done that with distinction. What is your point of order? Mr Speaker, uh, earlier in the day I, I raised with you a question about, what is your point of order? about a substantive motion being on, on the matter we're discussing now. You ruled there, it out of order. There is a motion for suspension of standing orders to allow the motion to be considered. The Treasurer has moved a motion and the House is considering it as the procedures required. The Honourable the Prime the Minister. Honourable when he made the allegations earlier in the, early in the afternoon, you ruled him in order. The Honourable the Prime Minister responded to questions entirely in accord with the standing orders. We are now dealing with a substantive motion moved by the Treasurer. The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, I want to say it again. I want to say it uh, on behalf of this government, on behalf of the members of the parties which he led. The Prime Minister has served and led Australia in relation to this issue with distinction, yeah. with utter distinction. 
And Mr. Speaker, the despicable attempts, the despicable and premeditated attempts by the Australian Labor Party to try and put racial slurs into this debate, to put racial slurs into this debate and to try and inflame passions ought to be absolutely condemned. And we condemn them. And we want to give those members that have injected those racial slurs into this debate the opportunity to come into this parliament and to come in and apologise. Mr Speaker, this is the apology squad. These are the people that love apologies. They, they ought to come down Honourable here, Mr Wills. Speaker, and they ought to apologise for the things for which they are Honourable responsible. Banks. Mr Speaker, this morning, this morning the Deputy Leader of the Opposition banks. In one of the most tacky performances you will ever see a parliamentarian engage in, walked up to a doorstop. He walked up to a doorstop this morning and he said, in a quote which he has now confirmed, he said this: "I do find it somewhat tacky, however, that the Prime Minister reacted with the exuberance that he so obviously did when he was given the news of the five-to-one decision against the Aboriginal woman." Women. The first point to make uh, about this, Mr. Speaker, is he says, "Oh, he was running off the front page of the Age." He says, "You were actually in the Parliament yesterday. You were here. You know that the Prime Minister made no reference yesterday to the High Court decision. You also know yesterday that the Prime Minister stood here and, and in response to an interjection from me, when I complained he'd given tax deductibility to the Evatt Foundation." He turned around and that picture was taken. The picture on the front page of The Age this morning was false and you knew it. And you took the opportunity to walk in and this is your now defence and say I was misled by The Age. You were not misled by The Age. You very deliberately and in a premeditated way came in this morning and you had determined to try and put a racial slur on the Prime Minister. And this is what you went on to say. These are the despicable words that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition went on to say. He said these words, this bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. Now, Mr Speaker, what, what, were people, what were people expected to understand by that comment? They were expected to understand one thing. They were expected to understand that the Prime Minister was pleased or would be happy about bashing blackfellas. That's the imputation you were trying to put on the Prime Minister. There is no other explanation as to those comments. It was not a discussion about the rights of native title. It was not a discussion about the High Court decision. It was not about pastoral lease. It was a racial slur, pure and simple, and you did it in a premeditated way. And Mr Speaker, if you had any decency, if the Leader of the Opposition had any decency, and I say to him now, before this debate finishes, he would walk to that dispatch box and he would say to the Prime Minister, I apologise. That's all you've got to say. I apologise. I withdraw. That's all you've got to say. And what are you being asked to withdraw? You are being asked to withdraw a statement which is so palpably false and despicable that a decent person would do it. You are being asked to withdraw these words. The bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. You are being asked to withdraw a racist slur which is despicable. Mr Speaker. And then we find the member for Banks. The member for Banks comes into this parliament and essentially confirms and confirms the statement that he made on Channel 2 on the 7.30 report on the 29th of May 1997. He confirms it. He confirms this quote. It's about time the Prime Minister showed leadership. Again, do you see the way in which they try and sneak the Prime Minister into these debates? It's about the time the Prime Minister showed leadership, and here is the quote, and he confirms it. There's only one thing missing from this debate, and that's the white sheets and the burning crosses, and that has been the undercurrent in this debate. I'll tell you what the undercurrent in this debate has been. The undercurrent in this debate has been a premeditated, conscious, Subconscious campaign by the Australian Labor Party to try and put slurs on members of the government. That has been the real undercurrent of this debate. You can see it from the deputy leader. You can see it from the member for Banks. I'll tell you what the undercurrent is, Mr. Speaker. They are trying to put into the subconscious, into the minds of decent Australian people, a despicable slur on the character of the Prime Minister. And if you had decency, you would withdraw it. You know that when you talked about white sheets and burning crosses, there was only one image which you were trying to conjure up. You were trying to conjure up the image of the Ku Klux Klan 
one of the most notoriously That's racist right. group that this century has ever That's seen. Right. You know that you were trying to conjure up that image That's and you right. were trying to project it onto the Prime Minister. You know that. That is why you made that statement, Mr Graceful. Speaker. It was a despicable allegation and a despicable statement, and you ought to withdraw it. Mr Speaker, this is a time-honoured tactic of the Australian Labor Party. I know that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, when a recent appointment was made to the ABC board, got up and said it was like Louis Farrakhan being put in charge of the Holocaust Museum, didn't you? Again, trying to put the racist smear out. The Australian Jewish community came out and condemned you, and they were right. They were absolutely The Honourable right. Treasurer resume his seat. The member oh, uh, for Wirral There's no the reference in the motion of the matter. Members the, remain the silent. Treasurer is now the Honourable addressing. Member will make his point of order. I'm well, I'm making my point of order. Well, making my point of order. There's no reference in the motion of the matters to which he's now the referring. The Honourable Member will resume his seat. The motion, the motion on a standing no order is fairly order. specific the Honourable and fairly narrow in the Parliament. The Honourable Sir, Member for Wirral should know it's suspension of standing orders. The Treasurer is entirely in order. This is, this, is, this is a sleazy pattern of behaviour. It is a pattern of behaviour which has been repeated on numbers of occasions. It is a pattern of behaviour which now draws in numbers of the front bench. It is a pattern of behaviour which has been put together to try and blacken the Prime Minister's name and to try and poison race relations in this country. And this is a pattern of behaviour which ought to be repudiated. It ought to be repudiated by those that started it. But if it can't be repudiated by those that started it, it ought to be repudiated by one person. It ought to be repudiated by the person who claims to be the leader of this little outfit. The person who claims to lead the member for banks, the person who claims to lead the deputy leader of the opposition, the person who would be a prime minister, the person who ought to have some decency and some leadership, the person who is too weak to turn to his own deputy and too weak to turn to his shadow minister and too weak to stand up to the racist slur. Why, Mr Speaker? Because he condones it. He condones this kind of behaviour while he refuses to make them apologise. We do not condone this kind of behaviour. This is dangerous behaviour in Australia, and those members ought to come in and apologise. And until they do, Mr. Speaker, they stand absolutely condemned. I ask members of the government to remain silent. The honourable leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, we of course oppose this motion. We oppose this motion, and we do so because. For many reasons, but not least, we do not accept strictures from a man who has no code of ethics as far as his ministers are concerned, no code, no moral ground to stand on, who has sat here in this place over the silent. course of the last two Honourable weeks and McEwen. defended Honourable the Bacon. absolutely indefensible in his Minister for, Minister for Mines, the absolutely indefensible, has allowed a person in this place, a, a minister in this place, to Members operate and continue quietly. to operate with a massive breach in a conflict the of interest. Leader of the opposition will resume his seat. Can I ask those members on the government who are leaving the House to do so and to remain silent? The Honourable Member of North Sydney on a point of order. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Following on from the point of order from the member for Werriwa, the Leader of the Opposition the is not addressing member. the substantive issue the before the House, member will the totally unrelated seat. The issue. Of the he should come back to the, the issue. The Honourable Member of North Sydney will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will have the same licence as the Honourable the Treasurer exercised. Well, thank you, thank you the very much, the Mr opposition. Speaker. That, that licence would the allow me to roam very far and wide silent. as far as this matter is concerned. This is a Prime Minister who claims weakness on this side of the House when he cannot stand up. He cannot stand up his own flatmate and assure a level of standard Patterson, in this community. A sure level Patterson. of standard in this community. That uh, level of standard in this silent. community. That anybody, anybody who's been able to enforce this in the past, any other leader has been able to enforce in the past. Now let me just go through the facts of this particular set of propositions and paint a picture, Mr. Speaker, of where the government is coming from on this matter. It is often the pattern, I am afraid to say, in politics that those who intend to victimise claim themselves to be victims. Exactly. This is not a particular attribute unique to this government. It is, a, in fact, a very old-fashioned piece of right-wing information and right-wing tactical determination as to how you operate. When you wish to victimise somebody, claim you are a victim. When you wish to victimise a community, claim you are a victim. And we have seen that pattern from this Prime Minister as he's clothed himself in unction. 
on these issues repeatedly. We, re we remember well back to the time when there was an invitation by this Prime Minister to freedom of speech. He said something new to the Australian population on that freedom of speech speech. That uh, said something new to them that they had thought that that thought that they'd had in their minds for years past that freedom of speech was a feature of Australian society had in fact unbeknownst to them been a situation repeatedly violated and indeed they had no freedom of speech until he liberated them everybody on this side of the house and everybody out there in Australian politics and I suspect everybody on your side of the house knew precisely what code the Prime Minister was talking in. And the Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs tried to come into this place and claim damage done to our society on these matters. Nothing compares with the damage that was done our society and our international reputation by the view that had widespread acceptance overseas that the Prime Minister deliberately coddled the member for Oxley, deliberately coddled the member for Oxley and her position. All members of the government remain and silent. And as a result of that, and as a result of that, serious damage was done to our society. Honourable but Foreign this Minister, Prime Minister, this Prime Minister, Minister felt, silent. nevertheless, that he was well served domestically, no matter what might Deputy be happening Leader of the opposition. internationally. He was well served domestically, no matter what might be happening internationally. That's another reason why we don't accept any strictures from, uh, from this uh, particular Prime Minister. And we well remember also. It's very difficult to get passion from this Prime Minister, genuine passion, but when he was up in front of the Aboriginal Reconciliation Conference a year or two ago and he had a set of victims in front of him, he was up there ebullient, ranting, hectoring, creating an environment in which he was saying to the rest of the Australian population, here I stand with you against them. Here I stand with you against them. That I'll was the North precise City. intention of the Prime I'll Minister. Patterson and if anybody silent. in their right mind, anybody who is a political analyst who in their right mind assumes that the Labor Party wants an election on WIC, after we've seen Borbidge out there wandering all over the back blocks of Queensland trying to drum up an opportunity in that regard, after we've seen <coughs> After we've seen the Prime Minister out there repeatedly giving assurances to those who don't need assurance on these matters, what we know from this Prime silent. Minister is, and he's been touting it for 12 months now. What do you think we've got? 24-hour memories on these matters for 12 months now. Everybody who knows anything about politics in Australia knows that this Prime Minister has been trawling for a weak election. That is why he is not seriously negotiated with all parties. He has been trawling for it. Therefore, we honourable must, member, the honourable therefore, member for we must and the honourable member for interpret the silent. events of today within the context of what is intended by the Prime Minister. And I can ask, I can ask for no further, uh, no further evidence to be provided than this. Here we have rehame monitors. Here we have confidential stamped across the top. And here we have marked the quote that the person is supposed to use, in this case Ruddock is supposed to use, the white sheets and the burning crosses. And what we have had from the, a repeat is, is a repeated effort. And so that if we ask, and the reason my friends while confidential is stamped there, and I do accept you backbenchers are a bit naive and innocent, but those on front benches understand these things. Those on I'll front benches McEwen. understand these things. The reason why confidential is up there was so if the member for Banks were to get up and say in his defence, read the whole quote, Mr Ruddock, or table a document from which you are quoting, he would be able to say to the Speaker, no, it's confidential. <laughs> and, Mr. Ruddock, and Mr Ruddock was a fool. The Minister for Immigration was a fool. All members of the government will remain silent. He had properly prepared for him a document. Properly prepared for him Mr. a Canning. document by the Prime Minister's office. I'll remember the Prime Minister. And he was uh, indeed, and here it is, Mr. Ruddock, for your use, Tony Nutt. He had a document given him by the Prime Minister's office, and he was dopey enough to give it to us. So we go on with these, uh, with this set of uh, propositions. There it is, underlined. Daryl Mellon, go to the white sheets and the burning crosses. So innocent was Mr. Ruddock of the content of this matter. So innocent was he that Mr Ruddock assumed that it had been made today. 
which is why and I now quote well, from what we've uh, managed. Well, I'm afraid I'm about to quote you, old son, so you can get up and give a personal explanation in due course. And he says here, Rudder, one of the Your comments— The member for Patterson will remain silent. One of the comments that worried me greatly this morning were the comments of the honourable member for Banks. The honourable member for Banks, who had the audacity to say there's only one thing missing from this debate, and that's the white sheets and burning crosses. Two mistakes, Mr Ruddock. Two no, mistakes, the Minister for Immigration. Side. Firstly, was to hand it to Mr Mellum, and secondly, was not to, to be so unoffended by the comments the that you hadn't been aware that they were made warned. a year ago. And then there was, and then what we go through was the actual comments. In the terms of the stolen generations, what we have to do is have so a considered response. And it is about time the Prime Minister showed leadership. There's only one thing missing from this debate. He's gone on to the general debate. Because if you actually go through more than just simply this, and I'm just using your paper, exactly. you'll see there were a lengthy set of comments exactly. by the member for Banks on the totality of the exactly. issue related to the stolen exactly. generation. Exactly. And in continuing in, reflec in reflection of that particular debate, he said there is only one thing, and that's the white sheets and burning crosses. I do think that the member for Banks was excessive in this, in this regard, which is why at the time I said for the member to the member for Banks, don't you introduce that topic into these, uh, these debates again. But of course I knew thoroughly that the member for Banks was not in fact referring to the Prime Minister. He was referring to the generality of the debate, and that is consistent with what is here. It's consistent with what is here, but not consistent, not consistent with what was given to Mr Ruddock to underline. <coughs> because what the Prime Minister wanted out of this was the exercise. I intend to victimise, therefore let me do deal with the victim. I intend to have a race election, therefore blame the other side for the race election. Well, there's still a few of us with our teeth in our head and a few friends downtown. We know your tactics. We know your tactics, friends, and we are not the least bit impressed by them. The Honourable Foreign Minister. Can I ask members on both sides to remain silent? It's extraordinarily hard to hear what's going on. The Foreign Minister. Speaker, the truly interesting Don't thing about rises. the Leader of the Opposition's speech was that not once in his speech did he in any way criticise the comments made by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition or the Member for Banks. Not once. And as the member, the member uh, for Denison makes the point the on behalf of the Opposition, he's from the front bench. He makes the point. He says, why should he? In other words, Mr Speaker, it's all right for the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, not for a backbencher, wayward backbencher, but the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, to say that, it's the, that this bloke, meaning the Prime Minister, seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. The, the Leader of the Opposition thinks that is all right. You think that is a satisfactory thing for your Deputy to say. You are quite happy with that. That is a standard that you will now bear right up until the election. That is your standard. But, Mr Speaker, what is so hypocritical about the Australian Labor Party and, indeed, the Leader of the Opposition is that when anybody on this side says something inappropriate, he, he holds the doorstop, he runs to the television cameras and says the Prime Minister should make that person apologise. Make him apologise. Now, if, I'm sure the member for Sw Swan will excuse me for raising this again, but the member for Swan did make inappropriate remarks about Cheryl Kernow. The Leader of the Opposition, leaders, uh, figures in the Opposition all rushed to the television cameras. Mon, of course, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was one of them. And, you know what a shameful thing this was to say. Cheryl Kernow was suggesting the Prime Minister had written the speech for the member for Swan, and oh, an apology had to be given, and the Prime this was a test to the Prime Minister's leadership. Well, the point is the Prime Minister demanded an apology, and he got an apology. And that is the standard that this Prime Minister has set. But with the Leader of the Opposition, the he, won't make, he won't make his deputy apologise and he won't make the, de the member for, ba for Banks apologise. That Senator Lightfoot made some very inappropriate remarks in the Senate when he, was first, uh, when he first took up his seat in the Senate. The Prime Minister rang him and told him to apologise. And he did. 
and he withdrew those remarks. But the Leader of the Opposition, without any leadership, without any courage, and frankly, dare I say it of, a man, of the man, without any decency, without any decency at all, will not ask the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to apologise. Why? Why? There are two reasons why. There are two reasons why. One of them is that you agree Deputy with him. Leader of the opposition, One of them is silent. that you agree with him. You think it's all right for him to say this bloke seems to be never so happy when he's bashing blackfellas. You think that's all right, do you? You think that's all right? Let's just get this straight. Do you think that's all right? No, you see, he says nothing. He says nothing. Why does he say nothing? Why doesn't he say, yes, I think that's all right? Because the in the back of his mind, he knows it's seat. all the wrong. Member of Newcastle you know it's all wrong. The, the minister appears to be asking seat. you a question again, Mr Speaker, and I suggest you, put uh, it, I suggest you answer it. Honourable member will resume his seat. The foreign minister Won't has the call. save the Leader of the Opposition. He knows what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said was wrong. He, he knows it. But what he won't do is make him apologise. Why not? Because you're weak. Because you're a weak man. You have no authority over your deputy. And I mean, a junior shadow minister for Aboriginal, the, your minister for Aboriginal, shadow minister for Aboriginal affairs, you have as a junior shadow minister sitting down there. Of course, what he said was appalling. Anybody knows that what he said was appalling to talk about the white sheets and the burning crosses. I mean, of course, it's appalling. When? When is your big argument? When? Well, it's all right, is it, if you said it last year? Last year was free range. You can accuse people of being members of the Ku Klux Klan, but this year it's not all right. Is that your standard? I must say, Mr. Speaker, I've been here for, for 13 years, for, uh, for 13 years, and I've heard a lot of arguments. But the argument that I heard today from the leader of the opposition was not only the weakest that I've heard in all the time I've been here, but frankly was of very questionable morality. The, honour the question is that so much of the standing on essential orders be suspended, so as to allow the honourable deputy leader, so as to allow the member for Holt and the member for Banks to apologise for trying to slur the prime minister with racism. Those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. Is the division required? Division required. The ayes have it. The ring the bells. Could I suggest that, although we might be in a vision, it's a good idea to desist from this name calling across the chamber? The Honourable Foreign Minister.
That's what the motion is. What about you and the League of Rights? Lock the doors. The question is that standing orders be suspended. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fish and Riverina tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong tell us for the nose.
<laughs> Members on both sides will desist from name calling across the House. The result of the division is ayes 84, noes 38. The question is therefore resolved by an absolute majority in the affirmative. As the motion has been agreed to, I will allow the members identified to approach the dispatch box if they so wish the purpose stated in the motion. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. No, I'm, happy to leave. I'm happy to approach seek the dispatch. Seek leave to address the House on the you motion. You want me to seek leave? Is leave seek granted? Leave. No. I seek, I seek, I seek oh, well, leave to respond to the motion. Point of order. Is leave granted? What? No, Mr Speaker. Point of leave order. Leave is not granted. Point of order. Do you have a point of order? The Leader of the House on a point of order. Uh, the motion allows them to apologise and only to apologise. I have received a letter from the Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted. Honourable Members will resume their seats. Honourable Members on both sides will resume their seats. Proposing that a definite matter of public importance, the Honourable Members will resume their seats, be submitted to the House for discussion. Including the honourable member for both of you, Charlton, and the member behind you for Maribyrnong, be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the heavy and unfair burden imposed by the Howard government's policies upon families caring for older relatives and children with disabilities. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed motion to rise in their places. Speaker, I move that business of the Leader day the be called on. Question is the business of the day be called on. Those in favour of the motion, please say aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the business of the day be called on. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fish and Riverina tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and what and Bruce Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong tell us for the noes. The result of the division is eyes 84, nose 35. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that the House at its rising adjourn until Monday, the 6th of April 1998 at 12.30 pm, unless the Speaker fixes an alternative day or hour of meeting. The question is the motion to be agreed to. Those in favour, please say aye against no. The Honourable Leader of the House.